Hi, Dr. Matthew here. Today I want to talk about starting students on a trombone. Now the information I'm giving here is uh, a little bit artificial. Uh, I'm by myself. Probably nothing will go wrong unless I drop my horn, in which case that's take two. Uh, when you're dealing with students, of course, things go wrong and you'll have to stop quite often and fix a hand position, fix an embouchure problem, fix a playing problem. And so in that sense, uh, this is again, this is a little bit artificial, but I do want to cover the basics of how to start students in trombone. You know, hand position, embouchure, how to correct, correct sound, uh, what notes to start on, and so on. First of all, and this is not really related to the trombone, but you need to find the serial number of every instrument. That is often hidden, but it's usually placed on the part of the instrument that is not replaced. In other words, on a clarinet, it would be on the long joint in the middle, not on the barrel or the mouthpiece. On a trumpet or a euphonium or a tuba, quite often that's placed on the second valve casing. And it's a long number. On trombone, it is usually right here, very close to where the slide and the bell are attached. And what you're looking for is a long number. Now, quite often students will look at the bell of the instrument and they might find, in my case, 42H. Well, that's actually the model number of the instrument. So in a Yamaha, if it's a YEP something or other, that's the model number. That's not the serial number. So find the serial number, write it down, just in case the worst happens. Another thing I've found is that it's very difficult to identify the top of the case from the bottom of the case. Again, this is something that we don't think about as adults, but for students, it's a real problem. Imagine taking a clarinet and opening the case, but it's upside down. So that's, that's the worst case scenario. Uh, find the case and take some masking tape and put the kid's name on the top of the case. That way they know the top from the bottom and they also know their instrument from the nine or ten other identical Yamaha or con trombones that are out there in the lockers. Now, once you've done that, you need to start with the instrument itself. Always make sure that the instrument is on the floor. Don't let the students put the trombone case on their lap and open it up because pants or skirts or jeans are slippery and things go off. So they start down on the floor. Uh, let me go through the parts of the instrument first. I'm not sure students, young kids really know, need to know most of this, but as a teacher, you do. This is the mouthpiece. There are different parts. Now I should say, my mouthpiece looks a little bit strange. It's a custom-made mouthpiece where it's, believe it or not, a removable rim, cup, and shank. But it's basically the same. So starting at the top, I'm going to approach the camera here. Hi. This is the rim. This is a part of the mouthpiece that actually contacts your face. It can be flat, it can be curved, or it can be in between. Uh, the Goldilocks principle. The best rim is in between. A flat rim makes more contact with your face, tends to give you a duller sound, a little more accuracy, but at the expense of upper range. A round rim has little contact on your face, tends to give you a very bright sound, rather easy high register, but at the expense of accuracy and the expense of tone quality, just a little shrill. So most rims are in between. Not round, not flat. I'm going to jump down here. Stands are not made for people who are six foot one. That's another story. In here is the cup. Cups can be bowl shaped, V shaped like a horn, or in between. The best is in between. Cups can be shallow, as the top to bottom uh, measurement is here, Large or deep, again, in between is better. A deep cup gives you a bigger sound, a warmer sound, at the expense of the high register. A shallow cup gives you a great high register, a rather shrill sound. What we're looking for is an in-between. This is the shank. It goes in to the trombone slide, the top slide. 
Technically, it goes into the lead pipe of the instrument. On trombone, there are two shank sizes. Small shank, and this really refers to the taper of the shank. Small shank is for student models and small bore trombones. If you look at my video on instruments and equipment, that explains what I mean when I say small bore. Large bore, this one for example, is for large bore trombones, professional models, and bass trombones. So there are only two shanks. Even though bass trombone and a large tenor are quite different in size, the shank size, the taper right here, has been standardized. I'm going to go off a little bit into my other instrument, which is euphonium. Euphoniums are also small and large shank, although some professional instruments, a Wilson and the Old Bessons, have a medium shank or a European shank. I mention this in case you happen to teach at a high school which has older Bessons, and this happens quite often. Uh, there are adapters for those things. Don't, no, 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 don't ever use those. They really destroy the sound. You have to buy an instrument, <clears throat> excuse me, a mouthpiece that fits that instrument and has that medium or European shank. Uh, for years and years, I played a Wilson, and that's just the way they designed those horns. Back to the trombone, only two, large or small. So, from the top, this is the rim, this is the cup, this is the shank. When you have a student hold the mouthpiece, have them hold it like this, not like this. See, you can't see what my embouchure is doing. Now you can. That's the mouthpiece. Next is the slide. This is the slide, oftentimes called hand slide because at the top of the bell we have a tuning slide. Very different. This is the hand slide for slide, the slide slide. There are two of them, outer slide, inner slide. Some very important components to this slide. At the top is a slide lock. The slide is unlocked. Here we go. That happens. Now, you can't tell when my heart starts racing. All trombone players are genetically programmed when the slide drops by accident. That happens. So to prevent that, lock the slide. Teach your, stu your students whenever they play, if they're not playing while holding the horn, the slide is locked. Parts of the slide, these are the outer slides. Inside are the inner slides. This is the crook. This is the spit valve. Does exactly what it says. Down here is a rubber bumper, which is important because when you hold the trombone and you're sitting in a chair, that rubber bumper sits on the floor and prevents the slide from doing this, from spinning. Also, the lead pipe. Now, I have custom made lead pipes. They're in and out. They're removable. That is not true of 99% of all the trombones. They're welded inside. The, the lead pipe is there and that's where the mouthpiece goes. So again, outer slide, inner slides, lead pipe, which is invisible, just you should know it's there. Slide lock and lock it at all times. Crook, rubber bumper, not rubber baby bumper, that's a different instrument, rubber bumper and spit valve. Now the bell. This is the bell, or bell section. Technically, this is the bell, but we're talking about the other half of the trombone that goes on the top, the bell. This is the bell itself. Mine measures eight and a half inches in diameter. Student horns are usually seven, maybe seven and a half. Professional horns are larger. This is a unique difference with trombone as compared, uh, compared to the other brasses. Uh, we have different sizes on trombone, different bores, different bells, quite a few. There could be as many as six tenor trombone bell diameters. This is the throat. Here is the tuning slide. 
Now, when you move the tuning slide out, take both thumbs, I'm going to go backwards here, and push straight up. I'll do it the other way. Push straight up. When you're moving it in, push down. What you want to do is make sure there is equal pressure on both sides. That is not a good way to move a tuning slide. Now, tuning slides should be out roughly about an inch and a half. That's, excuse me, that is where the horn is in tune. Quite often you, you'll look at young bands and you'll see all the brass players have their slides rammed all the way in. Sometimes students do that because they think it looks better or fits better in the case. You wanna make sure that that slide, however, is out, at least on trombone, should be an inch and a half. Many horns have a balancer, which keeps it easier to keep on your shoulder so that the, it's not as front heavy as you might think. Most horns have these. I have a valve, rotary valve, which I talk about in a separate video called, strangely enough, F attachment. This is an F attachment. This is not something you will find on a student horn. It's a professional instrument. So when I talk about hand position, there's going to be a slight difference between the way I hold that instrument and the way a student will, because a student doesn't have the valve and doesn't have all the extra tubing. This neural nut is what hooks this part of the instrument to the slide. Now, how do we start the mouthpiece? I'm just putting the horn together. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, you want to make sure that the amber set is set correctly. And the magic note that we keep in our heads is F. So if you're watching this video, just hum F. That is the best note to start all brasses except horn. Now the trumpet, the trombone, the euphonium, and the tuba are all instruments pitched in B flat. There is only a difference of an octave. So in other words, the trombone and euphonium are an octave below trumpet. The tuba is an octave below the trombone. The trumpet is transposing, but their written G is an F. That is the note you're aiming for when we're starting. When you're starting on the mouthpiece, when you're starting on vibrating your lips, your first note is an F. Usually that's the first note in band method books, although some start on something different. You want that middle F to come out nice and easy. Let's talk about embouchure. No embouchure, no trombone playing. It's critical. Bad embouchure, bad trombone playing. It is much easier in life, I think, to start the embouchure out correctly. Um, it's easy for me to talk about the don'ts, don't do this, don't do this. Uh, I'll try and keep it in a more positive way, not that I'm hurting anybody's feelings, but uh, I think it's easier to describe what you should do rather than what you shouldn't do. Embouchure. There are a number of ways to do this. Uh, I'm using the one that I've used for years. I know it works. I've seen hundreds of my former students start using this method. So it's easy and it works. There are different uh, ways to form embouchures. Fine, it doesn't make any difference to me. This just works for me. Have the student wet their lips. Say the letter M, M. Now I'm gonna add a couple don'ts. Don't squeeze your embouchure. Don't squeeze your lips. Say the letter M, take two fingers, You want them to get some kind of a buzz going. It should be roughly, again, in that magical note of F. You notice I dropped a little bit in pitch. When I talk, I think my voice gets, gets a little bit lower. You're trying to find that buzz essentially in the F range. Now, if they don't get it, if that happens, they need to relax. If this happens, too low. Make sure it's M, lips are together, and I'm putting two fingers on the corners so the air doesn't leak out the side. If it's too high, relax. Again, get to that F.
Once that's done, take the mouthpiece, hold it like this. Make sure they don't do that. This way you can see what's going on, at least on the outside part of the embouchure. Do exactly the same thing, letter M. Put this dead center between your nose and your chin, your left and your right. And I'm gonna do this a little close. Drop your jaw to breathe. And that should happen. Be prepared for laughing. I would say in advance, you're going to sound like a goose. Go from there. You want that to be as close to the F as possible. Things that could go wrong. That's too tight. You want to drop that buzz down to the middle F in bass clef. So, slower air. Relax. Drop your chin. What we're doing is slowing the airstream down so the vibrating column of air vibrates around that middle F, not around an octave higher. That, I think, rarely happens, but occasionally it does. It's too low. Go the opposite direction. Blow faster air. That's one. Firm your corners, making the air go faster. That's two. I hate, I hate to say the word tight, but firm everything from the lips down to the chin. And that increases the velocity of the buzzing airstream. Now, this may take a while. This is the advantage of me recording and talking to myself. Hey, everything went great, no problem. That'll never happen in real life. Try and get the kids to add an F as many as possible. Now, you could be a third either way in the direction. That's fine. I think if you're more than a fourth, too high or too low, you're going to have to adjust things. The idea, again, is to get the airstream moving faster if they're too low and slower if they're too high. The main thing is, and again, playing too high is, is the one you'll see more often than not. Relax, blow slower air. Go the other direction, firm up, blow faster. Make sure they don't pinch though. The middle of your lips should always be relaxed. Now we've gotten, hopefully, an F. Next, we put the horn together. So set the mouthpiece off. Take the instrument so that the slide is in your right hand, doesn't matter whether left or right-handed. And the bell is in the left. From this point on, there are two words that always have to be in your mouth, in your, your brain. Carefully is number one, and locked is number two. The slide must always be locked. Carefully put the two pieces together. Carefully move them close together so they are the slide and the bell forms a V-shape. And this distance, here to here, the bell to the slide, again, is about that much, about three inches. Once you're there, tighten it hard. Uh, if this isn't really tight, then the horn will slip apart and things go south from there. Next, take the mouthpiece and just set it in and turn slightly to the right. That sets this. Don't do that. There, that's the sound. That will get the mouthpiece stuck. It's a vapor lock. So just turn it in, turn it to the right. Now, the left hand position should be like this. Your first finger, always straight. The first finger should be up here on the shank of the mouthpiece. Again, I have a valve, but on a non-valve student horn, the thumb should be on that brace right there. Two fingers below and two fingers above. This is where things get a little bit complicated. So when I'm playing the instrument, I'm holding it like this.
That's uncomfortable. And the students will let you know right away it's uncomfortable. It's going to make their first finger hurt a little bit. You get used to it, but it is uncomfortable. It's a heavy instrument. The importance of that first finger is that when you're playing the instrument, it prevents the horn from slipping off to the left. It holds it up. Now that you've got the left hand correct, put the instrument on your shoulder. It should not be parallel, but down a little bit so it fits your face. And there's the hand position. If you look down the horn, the slide and the bell should form roughly a V. And there are numerous positions online and in method books that show you the correct position. Hand position is very important in trombone. If it's incorrect, things go wrong because the instrument is quite heavy. Now your right hand. You're going to almost do the old Star Trek thing here. You want to take, this is where you unlock the slide, your thumb goes to the bottom of this brace. These two fingers are opposite, these two fingers are below. Two fingers above, two fingers below, thumb at the bottom of the brace facing you. Your thumbnail should face you. Why the bottom of the brace? Because when you're playing, the bottom of the brace is actually roughly in the, the plane, horizontal plane, that the slide will be moving. This way it isn't. And the hand should be like this. Think of it as the way you would walk down the street. You don't walk down the street with your hand straight out or in a fist, just like this. Now at this point, have the students move the slide in and out. We'll talk about lubrication in the uh, recording I did called Care and Maintenance. Now this is a rather awkward hand position compared to an instrument like a trumpet or a tuba, but it's important to get it correct. That's how we hold the instrument. Um, notice that I just emptied my spit valve and I bring the mouthpiece up to me and I blow without buzzing. That's how you enter the spit valve. Mouthpiece is back on. You may want to get the F in the kid's head, do a uh, kind of a, a reminder. Now, when they're holding the horn at this point, try this on the mouthpiece. They're blowing slower to get lower and moving the, firming the corners to get higher. Do that so they have an idea of what it, it needs to change the pitch on that buzz. You also might want to try, excuse me, there's a trombone tone. Try a simple song. Now, I don't know how to tongue at this point, so I'm just playing the pitches. And that gives them an idea of what it takes to get different pitches on the mouthpiece. Everything that goes into the mouthpiece comes out the bell. Pinched bad tone on the mouthpiece, bad tone coming out of the trombone bell. The mouthpiece buzzing should have as much buzz, as much noise, as much goose as possible because that is the, uh, the way we produce a good sound. Put the mouthpiece in the horn by setting it, turning it to the right, or in the correct position. Now, drop your jaw when you breathe, just like you're saying, oh, oh. Keep the lips inside the mouthpiece, oh, and inhale. Now, if miracles occur, all your kids will get that note. If not, adjust as needed. Too low. Firm corners, blow faster. Too high. Relax, blow slower. Way too high. 
Really relax, blow slower, open, drop your jaw. So anything you find that will be able to get the, the velocity of the airstream down to get the right note is good. This is your first note, F. Now, I always think it's important in the first lesson to get some songs going. You can start songs on the F, and you're going to be using F, E flat, D flat. So that's one way. You realize, of course, that we're playing that song in D flat major, which is a little mind boggling. Kids won't know that. Another way is to start in the key of B flat, which means D, C, B flat. those three notes. I think that's probably better because that will correspond more to the notes they will find in their method book. Two things that I just did but I haven't talked about. Tonguing. Once you play that F, immediately play three or four more in a row in one breath. That way you have the concept of an unending stream of air. That's very devilish to get rid of. So three or four notes in a row after the initial one, so they make sure they're playing uh, with a steady stream of air that does not stop until they take a breath. Slide positions, I'm going to go very quickly. Judge by your eye. First is up here, third is a little bit below the bell, second in between, and so on. That's going to take a little bit more time than I want to spend, but that's a fairly simple thing. Use your ear, use your eye. Judge using the bell. So the first four notes on first four positions in trombone, first, second, third, fourth, are all in relationship to the bell. First, all the way up. Third, a little above the bell. Fourth, a little below the bell. Third, above the bell. Second, in between. Now from there, uh, I would have the kids play some songs, three note songs. Do that for the following week and see what they're doing. A lot of the second lesson is damage control, fixing problems that may occur. Uh, the two or three that I see the most are pinch sound. I'm not sure how that tone quality comes, but it's, it's caused by a pinched throat. Make sure the kids play with a relaxed throat saying, ah. A second problem is stopping the note with the tongue. You start by saying, ta, ta, ta. Here's stopping the note with the tongue. My tongue is literally going between my teeth and stopping the air, almost a doit sound. So careful on that. And the third thing is stopping the air between each note. You can hear that the sound actually stops between notes because the vibration stops. Make sure they do it all in one breath. One way on trombone to fix that is to do the song without tonguing. That's the only instrument that can do that in the wind family. And it is funny. It's a glissando. Uh, you can't do a glissando if you're stopping the air between notes. So it's a good teaching technique. That's a very quick, uh, about a half an hour. Uh, again, I did that with no problems. You have to budget in time when you're starting to remote players to fix the problems as they occur. But that is uh, a standard way to start students on a trombone.